Good morning, everyone. What an incredible and exciting thing to be in a room full of actual humans without screens, without anything. It's unmediated flesh and humanity. Very exciting to be back at the Perugia International Journalism Festival and to see you all here. And thank you for coming to our session. Um, I am Samir Padania. I am a consultant and researcher. I work on public interest journalism and how it gets funded around the world. Um, last year I wrote uh, or led the, re the writing of a report that was from the Forum on Information and Democracy which uh, was called A New Deal for Journalism and that looked at the growing crisis around the world in independent information, independent journalism and how different kinds of actors could respond to that. Governments, philanthropies, uh, investors and so on and one of the things that we spotlighted in that report was an initiative called the International Fund for Public Interest Media um, which was at that point a um, had sort of been proposed it was you know a talk there was a feasibility study it was very detailed that looked at what this fund could be how it could be implemented and uh, what kind of support it would need to get off the ground and um, Cut to December 2021 and the Summit for Democracy, which was a US um, State Department led initiative to bring democracies together and those who are supporting democracy um, around the world in a sort of collective effort to bolster and strengthen um, the role of democracy. You know? And headlining within that was the role of independent information and media. And no less than the President, President Biden himself talked about something called the Independent Fund for Public Interest Media and announced a commitment of up to $30 million for it. So, you know, this is something that is clearly a, uh, a major intervention in the landscape. Um, for somebody like me, who's worked in this sector for a couple of decades now, although obviously I look very young, um, and, and this is, you know, elective shaving, um, you know, we've seen, you know, I in my career and many others for longer have seen for, you know, literally now decades trying to persuade governments, philanthropies, different kinds of actors to, of the importance of investing in independent information and journalism. So, you know, for many of us in that sector to see the President of the United States giving, you know, literally personal validation to a fund of this kind that is designed to support and strengthen journalism around the world was a significant moment. It's a sea change, hopefully. It marks a sea change for the sector as a whole. But what we wanted to do with this session was probe that a little bit more from some different angles and to look at what does such a fund actually mean? You know, how will it work? How will it be seen from not just the sort of funder perspective, but also the perspective of those who would be involved or in at the other end of it, if you like? Um, so for that, we have with us three people. I'll start on my right. Um, Nishant Lalwani is um, at the Luminate group in Luminate, the funder, um, and was a key part of making the International Fund uh, a reality, really, and um, is a co-founder of the fund and uh, had sort of, for example, I think it was a Guardian piece that you sort of partly announced. A couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, and that came out, did it come out at the festival or around the time of the festival? Or? Actually, at the Global Media Freedom Conference. Ah, okay, so a bit later. But Okay, then to my left, we have Khadija Patel, who is not only chairperson of the International Press Institute and a longstanding and prominent South African journalist, but now the head of programs of the fund itself. And then to my far left, Zoe Titus, who is the head of the Namibia Media Trust and is also chairperson of the Global Forum for Media development, which is uh, one of the key groups globally that brings together all those groups and all those organizations that work to support, protect, promote the role of independent media and journalism around the world and to strengthen media and journalism and infrastructure in myriad societies. So I wanted to start with Nishant. Can you just give us an insight into where this fund, where this intervention came from? What was the sort of motivation? What brought it about? 
Thanks so much, Shamir, and uh, really good to be here with you all. Um, just before I answer that, um, I just wanted to say, uh, to note how cool it is to be uh, on a panel with three other people of color. And that, I don't think that's a, happened to me on a panel before. Um, <laughs> and especially, especially not on a panel that has nothing to do with diversity or decolonizing journalism or, I mean, has everything to do with that, but also nothing to do with that. And so, um, Thank you, Khadija, for organizing this. Um, uh, as uh, Samir was mentioning, I'm a um, uh, co-founder of, of the fund, along with James Dean. James, will give a quick wave at the back there. Um, and we, um, we noticed, uh, as did basically the rest of the sector, that there was a really acute and urgent lack of funding for independent media organizations, especially um, in low- and middle-income countries. So, you know, I um, lead, le led and still lead media funding at Luminate, which is a philanthropic entity um, supported by the founder of eBay. And basically all of our grantees, but especially those in Latin America, Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, said that there's very, very little journalism funding. It's consistently Luminate, the Open Society Foundations, NED, and then perhaps whichever local millionaire or billionaire is interested in funding the news, which can be a double-edged sword. Um, and, and so that, that kept coming up as the binding constraint for growth or even survival of many of these organizations. So the, 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 the idea was planted there, and then, of course, there's a ton of research to back that up. The Journalism and the Pandemic Project done by ICFJ um, in their first survey showed that 40% you know, of the organizations they surveyed had revenues um, that went down by half during COVID. The Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism showed that around $30 billion, I believe, had been lost during the pandemic in advertising revenue to news organizations. This fantastic GFMD survey, which you should all have a copy of on your seats, shows that 46% of the organizations surveyed, um, media organizations, um, are at risk of closing or significant downsizing if they don't receive emergency funding. So... Funding to media organizations is a huge, huge issue. Now, what happens when you have a market failure for a public good? Because public interest media is a public good. You cannot have a functioning democracy without um, a, free, a free and independent media. So what happens when you have a market failure for a public good? Well, usually the state steps in. I mean, that's what would happen if it was education or if it was vaccinations. That is what happens. But it's really hard for states... Um, or even um, large corporates to fund media directly. Um, it's political, um, there's the um, very high chance of editorial interference, um, advertently or inadvertently. Um, and frankly, they're not particularly nimble and um, you know, uh, experienced grant makers when it comes to providing funding to, to ind individual organizations. So, th so then what we're faced with is the, 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 the market failure can't be solved as it normally would in other sectors. And so, really, the genesis of the International Fund was trying to create a vehicle whereby large government donors and large corporates could put in um, significant volumes of new capital to fund independent media, media and essentially create a bridge to a new paradigm of journalism. Now, uh, we can talk about this slightly later in the panel, but to get to that new paradigm, you need significant innovation. Uh, and I can talk a bit about what innovation means later. But today, news organizations are dying out um, all over the world. And we have to stop that from happening. Otherwise, we have serious issues with autocracies encroaching and democracies dying out. And so the International Fund uh, has been put in place and has begun to raise money in order to try and stop that and ensure that there isn't a media extinction event over the next 10 years. Thanks, Nishant. Zoe, if I can come to you. So, as I said, you were your chairperson of GFMD, Global Forum for Media Development, and Nishant kindly teed up this document that you've, as, a, um, as an organization, just released, which is informing the initial priorities for this fund. So, can you just talk us through a little bit of, about that? What have you found? What are, the, what are the main findings of that research? Thank you very much, Samir. Um, this is a very dense study. Uh, you have the benefit of having the executive summary. Um, so, but um, to, to give you some background, it's in November last year, 2021, 
um, that um, IFPM uh, approached uh, the GFMD to um, assist with the survey of its members, um, partners, stakeholders, um, on how um, the fund could proceed to um, implement um, these very um, ambitious goals uh, that it had. Um, I'm not going to talk about issues of methodology or anything like that. I think the most interesting and important thing for you is to understand um, what the key findings um, of the study are and what the key recommendations are. So in, in short, a summary of the findings is that most respondents of the study, and there were about 173, um, and I can also indicate that this is probably not the final uh, piece of research that IFPIM will be conducting. Um, this would be an ongoing process, but this, this, this is, um, call it um, a baseline study um, to kickstart the, the work of the fund. Um, so uh, m respondents uh, were mixed in their priorities between authoritarian regimes, weak democracies, and hybrid regimes. Um, because the question was asked, you know, which kind of regime should be, be foregrounded. Um, but with authoritarian regimes emerging as both high and low priority, um, there was strong agreement um, that editorial independence and professional standards um, and transparent ownership uh, in terms of finances, governance should be the most important criteria for determining whether uh, to support an organization. And I mean, but that is along with a wide variety of other factors for potential consideration. Um, emergency core support, also the, the query about what kind of support is needed. Um, so emergency core support for independent media or journalism organizations at risk of closure or significant downsizing emerged as a leading uh, preference. Um, but there is less clarity around the second priority, which is between core restricted support to well-established independent media or journalism organizations and startup funding for new independent media and journalism organizations or projects. Respondents in general agreed that the fund should prioritize a two-year funding period. The length um, of the funding is, is uh, uh, incredibly important. It speaks a great deal in term due to the issue of sustainability. Um, preference among the options for disbursing funding reflect a need to balance the overriding principle of independence via open call, um, and we will hear uh, the, the, the format that will be used, um, by an open call by the fund with the importance of localized knowledge by a partnership with national or regional media development organizations. Respondents are highly open to suggesting specific institutions for support. Um, that means um, you know, potential recipients would want to become actively involved in how the fund is managed. Um, this speaks to a sense of ownership already uh, from, from the uh, onset. Respondents are eager to provide assistance to the fund or become recipients themselves. Um, I call it the three C's, complementarity, collaboration, cooperation, consultation, and cohesion are the issues that remain paramount. So in terms of recommendations, an underlying theme running throughout, uh, throughout the responses is how the fund can make a unique contribution to the media community by supporting media with limited opportunities to receive funding from other sources, providing support in ways that other funders cannot or, uh, cannot, um, or do not currently do and expanding access to, uh, to quality information for underserved uh, audiences. Um, in addition to that, prioritizing countries and themes where other funders are currently less active, providing a buffer between funding and um, any one particular funder, and leveraging the collective power of the fund's own contributors. There are additional um, you know, recommendations for the fund's next steps, um, among them being to engage in targeted follow-up consultations. I believe that a part of today's uh, um, briefing is also part of that consultation. Um, 
then explore the theory of change um, to ensure contextualization, to continue to cultivate trust, uh, to develop contingency plans, and to, importantly, keep it simple. So, um, and, I think... And so, just to be clear, so the respondents there, that layer of groups that... that it's not necessarily direct media organizations that are doing reporting on the ground, or is it a mix of those who are doing reporting and those who support, provide support to the media? It's a, mixed, uh, a mix of groups. Uh, in fact, um, I mean, if you want more specific data, um, I can s give you a profile of the respondents. Um, the highest number of respondents work internationally okay. and represent nearly a quarter of all the respondents, that's about 24%. And then, uh, in addition to that, uh, about 41% amongst the respondents, that was re those that represent media development or journalism support nonprofits. Yeah. Um, but okay. there was a general even split okay. between the respondents. Yeah. Okay. So it's good. I mean, in, in, in some sense, it's a representative sample of those on the front line of the challenges. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not people who are removed from dealing with these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis and they have an intimate knowledge whether directly of doing journalism or through very close support and uh, interaction with groups that are doing it. Thank, uh, thanks for that. that. I think tees up Khadija quite nicely. And so Khadija, there's a very wide menu of things. That there is a profound global crisis in many ways. So where can you, you know, you. You're a journalist by training. You've spent your career in journalism, newsroom leader. You're the chairperson of the IPI, right? This is, you know, this is the trajectory of a journalist. So you've chosen to jump across into this organization at this time. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Why, you know, what, I what is it that has made you go, okay, I don't want to work in, or, you know, it's not that you don't want to work in journalism, but this is a more urgent thing than your urge to do journalism. Thanks, Samir. And I think I speak for many people here at the festival when I say that journalism is the best job in the world. It really is. Um, and I love journalism, and I love being a journalist. But I've had first-hand ex first experience of the precarity of being a journalist in low- and middle-income countries. I spent most of my career in digital news startups. My first boss is over here, Branko Brickage, started off um, under his leadership, I went on to found my own startup and I eventually ended up at the Mail and Guardian in South Africa um, as the editor-in-chief. So through the trajectory of my career, um, I, had an I had the experience of number one, the profound democratizing potential of the internet and then its limitations to how journalism as we know it may continue. Because when I stood in the Mail and Guardian newsroom, and I love that institution, and for many of you who are aware of the landscape of media in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Africa as well, the Mail and Guardian has a particular history in ensuring democracy in South Africa, ensuring victory over the apartheid regime. And as I stood as a leader of that newsroom, my experience was actually very dispiriting because what I was managing effectively was round after round of layoffs because the overall business simply cannot support the newsroom as it was built. And in the meanwhile, we didn't really have much of a runway to try new things because we're trying to ensure that we pay salaries next month, right? So all our efforts uh, in innovation actually are channeled in survival, right? Um, and it is a dispiriting environment for a journalist, for a newsroom leader. I say this again, journalism is the best job in the world, but it's forcing so many people out simply because we're not sure about how this institution, that this public good may continue. And I remember still being at the Mail and Guardian when the feasibility study was published, and I was absolutely thrilled by it. Um, I remember 
printing it out all 40,000 word pages, 40,000 words at, in the Mail and Guardian printer and depositing it on my CEO's desk and saying, help is on the way. Um, so for me, you know, just the fact that there was this idea and this idea was being pursued with such thoughtfulness and diligence and consultation um, excited me. A couple of months later, I left my job um, and I was then approached to join the International Fund and for me, it was an I felt like it was important for me to do it, to leave the newsroom. Not because I don't love journalism, not because my ideal job is still, my ideal job is still to write stories, it's to still tell the story of the world. That's what I want to do. But I'm passionate about the endurance of journalism and the endurance of public interest media. And in the places that I come from, in South Africa and in neighboring countries, I, I, can, I see the shrinkage and I can understand firsthand how journalism as a profession may become available to only elites in society and how a woman like me from my background may actually never be able to be a journalist in years to come if we do not arrest the decline now. So that's what's brought me here to the International Fund. I've never done media development. Um, I've always been on the other side, filling out proposals, um, grant applications, and reporting. Um, so it's a whole new experience in trying to understand how this is done. But I think it's an exciting opportunity because it's a new organization to try new things as well. It is for me an opportunity, not just for this one organization, but for us as society, to come together and to assert the value of journalism and public interest media as a public good. I think that this is what this organization is a product of. It is an assertion of the value of journalism to our prosperity as humanity. Not just our prosperity, but our survival. And that's what brings me here. And I think that we're making good progress. Um, I've been at the fund now for about nine months and we're excited to announce that next month we'll be launching an open call in at least 15 countries. I can't tell you where all those countries are because you know, there's still a lot of due diligence that has to go into ensuring um, we can work there. But as Zoe pointed out, there is an urgency in meeting this crisis. This fund is not meant to replace the efforts of our other colleagues. Your efforts are vital, they are essential, but rather what we are trying to do is complement that, to ensure that in the short term, media survives, that people are able to understand what it means to be human in their context in real time, but then work together with the ecosystem to understand how journalism must evolve how we will find a new paradigm for journalism. So that's what brought me here, and um, very, very happy with the progress we've made so far. Okay, so can you, actually, can we go a bit further into that progress? I think it's interesting to know that there's an open call. We will watch with interest, and fascinating to know the mix of countries. Can, can you give us some, some of the sort of, if you like, the big picture, factors about the fund, you know, the sort of who's funding it, where, you know, where, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of operational stuff. I think there's some, you know, James's 12 million word study, I think, <laughs> lays it out very neatly in terms of governance and things like that. There is a structure, I think, that, you know, we can, we can read and it's on the site and things like that. But, I mean, you know, there are certain pieces in place. You have very prominent co-chairs to your board. You have, you know, funding that's been committed, you have uh, staffing in place, you have some sort of structures happening regionally and things like that. So can you just talk, talk us through a little bit of that so we understand exactly what we're talking about in the, in the big sort of struts of it? Sure. So at its core, what, um, what we're trying to do is we are going to high income countries and taking, you know, the message from the New Deal report as well. We are trying to persuade 
governments with ODA budgets, with development aid budgets, to dedicate at least 1% of development aid budgets to media development. Cumulatively, the figure right now is about 0.3%. And we believe that even if we're able to nudge that to 0.5%, it will be a step change of hundreds of millions of dollars. But crucially, this must be new money. And this is why it is an opportunity for us to assert that this is an opportunity. This is a moment for us to dig deep and to channel new money into media. So we're going to the high income countries and uh, Samir mentioned the US who pledged up to $30 million last year. We've also ha got contracts signed with Taiwan, with Switzerland, Sweden, um, and some others. Uh, Nishant, help me out, yeah? Uh, I, yeah, and the, yeah, the other, you know, the other part of the, the puzzle is coming from corporates, um, and we're particularly knocking on the doors of the technology corporates, first of all. And um, we've, re we've had a good reception from there so far. We've received um, money from Microsoft. And um, supplementing that, of course, will be private philanthropy as well. So that's you know, the three pieces of the puzzle of where the money is coming from. Um, and we have an independent board, so n you know, none of the funders have a say about who gets funded where, but rather you know, the decisions are made independently, and our board is headed by Maria Ressa and Mark Thompson, um, so two very capable individuals leading a very ambitious effort, I think, um, which is only apt. And so this is an initiative that is meant to enable the media resilience of low and middle income countries. That is basically, where, you know, what we're trying to do. The greatest need really is in low and middle income countries. Um, so we will work across Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the Middle East and North Africa, Asia Pacific. Um, and even within our first call, we're trying to ensure that we have that geographic diversity um, thrown in right through. This is, like I said, it's an opportunity, um, but it is new. And we want to hear from as many people as possible as well about what they think is working. And I think that a key component of how we want to ensure the fund builds itself is first of all to ensure that decisions are made regionally, that they are made, this is a, the, the fund is envisioned to be a decentralized structure, so there will be regional offices and decisions will be made regionally through bespoke in-country strategies, so we're not coming with cookie-cutter approaches trying to make a Colombia strategy work in Namibia, right? We want to try to be as agile as possible to respond to local challenges. Um, and on top of that, I think that what is essential is to understand what is working and what is not. To enable a transfer of knowledge, because as much as financial capital is needed, I think that my experience is that knowledge capital is similarly needed. Um, and to have access to knowledge about what's working in context similar to you is really, really important. Um, because an outlet that has something working in Malaysia is not necessarily in competition with somebody in rural Colombia, but they may have very similar communities that they're serving where strategies could be shared. So that's, you know, what we want to ensure happens, but we want to ensure that that knowledge capital also feeds back into our grant making strategy. That we want to be agile, we want to be able to respond to what's working to better incentivize that um, and to push it along further. So that is essential and then the fund is not envisioned to be here forever. It's envisioned to be here for 10 years. And within these 10 years, we want to work together with the ecosystem, with, with the various players, governments that are reform-minded, that are friendly, that are respectful of media independence, um, technology companies, media institutions, and academics, and everybody else, to understand how we need to ensure that reform must take place in order to ensure the survival of media. 
Thanks so much, Khadija. I, I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, I think you listed all of the countries, the political and corporates, which have um, which have funded us. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that the kind of the, cat the catalytic startup funding for IFPIM was provided not just by Luminate, but also by MacArthur, Craig Newmark Philanthropies, and the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, so that um, it was, you know, one and a half million dollars, not not world changing, but it's enabled the the fund to begin work and raise much, much more than that from large donors. So a huge thank you to those initial donors. And um, I think Khadija also mentioned um, most of the geographies we work in. Um, we've recently decided to add um, Eastern Europe um, to our scope of work um, for reasons that will be obvious. Um, so, you know, uh, in addition to the ones that Khadija mentioned, the open call may include countries in that region too. Okay, thank you both. We'll come on, we will, I, I do want to come back to the Eastern Europe, Ukraine question. I think it's sort of unavoidable, but I think, you know, w one of the things here that we're talking about is that this is a profound crisis that far predates Ukraine. You know, Ukraine has crystallized and, and, and sort of brought into sharp relief some of these questions. But I think that this is a, you know, this is a, 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 a question and a problem that has been building over well over a decade. Um, Zoe, so I wanted to come to you to talk really, you know, like I said, you have two hats. You know, earlier you were talking from a sort of GFMD, a network hat, a global hat, representing all these different groups around the world. But you, you know, you're also involved in your own national context in Namibia. And, you know, in terms of trying to protect and defend the public interest and the, the media, that part of the media ecosystem and grow it in Namibia and you know you also engage across the region and so on so can you can you give us a you know what does this environment look like from your perspective in Namibia and and what you know what is available when you're sitting in a in a place like that to try and you know do the things that everyone's talking about you know we've talked at quite a high level but you know I want to get really really concrete about you know your you know what do you see in the organizations that you're working with what what are the challenges they're facing in terms of getting money and what you know a, a, and being able to survive and what does something like an international fund add to the mix in addition to what's already in place that's a very long loaded question but I'll, I'll try my best um, um, the other hat that I wear is um, as director of the Namibia Media Trust uh, the Namibia Media Trust is the sole owner and publisher of the Namibian newspaper, um, owner of a printing press and um, other media um, interests. Um, but this business model ensures that there are no individual shareholders that profit from the, you know, the income generated by the commercial entities. Um, and in this way, by... Um, you know, uh, using this model, um, our founding editor, Gwen Lister, was very, very clear that the editorial independence or the trust model would ensure um, the protection of um, the editorial independence of the newspaper. Um, because um, for us, I mean, the, the Namibian is um, the traditional legacy media. Um, it has a very uh, illustrious uh, history in terms of being very central to the independence of, of, of the country. Um, so as an institution in Namibia, it is so deeply grounded in the history and, 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 and just the lived experience, I think, of every Namibian. So it was... Um, I think we did our first study around about 2019 when um, we just did our own study on the impact of, you know, digitalization on the media. And we discovered, obviously, at that time that uh, Namibian media had certainly not um, been very responsive to the changing digital, uh, the, the changing landscape. But it is most definitely with COVID that was literally the the nail in the coffin. Um, within six months, 37% uh, of um, 
the staff was retrenched of the newspaper. It, I think we, we still feel the impact of that. Um, and it's very difficult to have to live uh, with the fact that you have substantially downsized your newsroom at a very, very critical time when journalism is so important, uh, independent journalism is so, so, uh, so important. Um, you know, also the scope for innovation requires some sense of cushioning. So there's very little space for innovation in, in, in an environment where you are cash-strapped, where you are literally, um, you know, um, just trying to, you know, uh, put bread, you know, on the table. So that is a very, very um, difficult situation right now. So most, most definitely, uh, I mean, for the Namibian, for the Namibia Trust, um, the, an international fund for public interest media as a lifeline um, that may potentially secure its future because those opportunities for innov innovation have been explored. You know, paywalls, diversification of funding models, um, those have been explored. But at some point, you need breathing space. And I think breathing space is what potentially is being offered uh, right now. In the broader ecosystem, um, let's just look at the region. Namibia, by the way, uh, also ranks number one in terms of press freedom uh, in Africa. So um, the perception is that um, there are no violations generally of media freedom, freedom of expression, there is general safety, but I tend not to agree with that. Um, I do believe that um, one of the reasons potentially why Namibia is ranked number one is because the boundaries of that space is not being adequately challenged. Um, and I see, for example, in our neighboring South Africa, where, um, which does not rank us highly, but there is a daily contestation um, and testing of that free expression space, which I really would like to transfer across the border. Um, so it's then deeply important to understand the ecosystem because, I mean, um, we can't compare apples and pears here. Namibia is a country of 2.5 million compared to South Africa's 53 million. Um, and a very small market compared to a huge, diverse market. Um, but um, the needs are equally important. Um, and it is hoped that the fund would uh, employ that equity across you know, the very diverse um, needs that are there. Um, that's your challenge, Khadija. So um, have I answered your question? I think my question was, as you say, long and loaded. <laughs> um, but I think that, I mean, that gives us some very good context. I think, I mean, just this is a personal observation, really. I think what, one of the, you know, I work on the funding ecosystem in, you know, as part of my work. You know, I have to keep across what's going on in the U.S. You know, U.S. is, you know, we've got panels, you know, in the, in the, in the festival that are about, you know, foundation-funded journalism and philanthropy for journalism in that's drawing on US examples, for example. You know, I work within the European context a lot of the time, and actually there is very, very little philanthropy for journalism in Europe, by and large. And in the US, you know, we see examples, and they're very widely reported, and they're written about in Neiman Lab and everything else, where you'll have, you know, a city in the US getting 6, 10, 20 million mobilized from a variety of funders. That's equivalent to the amount that's gone from the US government to the International Fund for Public Interest Media for billions of people. So I do want to point out there is a, you know, sorry, I got slightly angry there. Um, but I, I think that this is a very important thing to understand, that we're talking about, you know, literally 100 plus countries. We're talking about billions of citizens worldwide who, whose, whose voices and information environments are not part of the international discourse as much as they deserve to be. The research about you know, what they need, what challenges they face, and all of that sort of stuff. 
I think has not hitherto been sufficiently at the heart of a lot of money flows, really honestly. So I think to me, this is an interesting moment. And so I wanted to come to you and to ask you, you know, you, you are a funder, you work for a sort of Silicon Valley derived fund in a way, right? And you are interacting with a great, you know, you're, you're taking this idea to other funders. You know, you mentioned some of the philanthropies and so on that have that helped seed it. But you're talking to governments, you're talking to enormous, you know, movers of money. Um, just give us an insight, you know, before we, you know, and I do want to come to, to you, there is an enormous amount of experience in this room. You know, people I look at in here, you know, you have deep, deep experience, lived experience of these challenges. So I do want to come to you and ask questions very shortly. But I did, before we do that, I wanted to come to Nishant and just get an insight into the mind of money, you know, <laughs> if you like. You know, wh where, what are the sorts of challenges? What are the sorts of ideas? What are the priorities that you're encountering as you're trying to advocate for something like this and make it lift off? Thanks, that's a great question. I mean, there's a couple of things I, I'll talk about. One is how we frame media and journalism as a public good, picking up on, on Khadija's comments. And then the second is what the potential solutions are to this crisis and, and how donors are thinking about that or sometimes not thinking about it. Um, so on the first point, um, I feel uh, having been in journalism funding for a little while and having been had made this mistake, myself, um, so it comes from a place of humility, <laughs> um, I hope. I feel that many journalism funders um, think that the solution for business model sustainability for journalism lies within the media sector alone. And it's important, I think, for us to move beyond that idea. Um, journalism, the, you know, the crisis in advertising revenue and journalism sustainability, you know, took a turn for the worse 20 or so years ago when digital advertising markets shifted and the attention economy was invented. That was not journalists who did that. Um, it was a structural change in the market. Journalism suffered because of that. And now asking journalists to solve that problem, um, I think is unfair. Um, and I feel that many of the conversations are, what are you, you know, as a small organization in Namibia doing about this global crisis? Uh, which is, you know, it's not, it's not the right question. Um, so, what we need to think about is where, what the solution sets are. And the solution sets, in many cases, are regulatory or are about new financial instruments, whether they're new trust models or new subsidy models um, that, can, that can bridge this market failure. And those things obviously directly affect journalism, but they're not, journal journalists are very rarely the decision makers or the CEO of media organizations or the EDs of nonprofits that in the media development space are very rarely the organizations who are um, you know, making regulation decisions or financial structuring decisions that can affect the whole sector. So we need to take a step back. Yes, journalism organizations could have been more nimble, could have perhaps responded better, could have done a better job of engaging, re engaging audiences in, in deeper, more revenue generating ways, but that's not gonna get to 100% of the solution. So that's been a long part of the conversation and continues to be with many funders. The other thing which we, um, which we noticed is that a big shift in the last few years, um, COVID and then of course Ukraine as well, is that many funders have realized that having healthy information ecosystems is no longer a matter of holding power to account or public debate, but now is a matter of national security. It's a matter of health of their populations. It's a matter of having, uh, of resisting the spread of autocratic practices to democracies around the world. So this has gone from an issue which is like a media freedom issue to an issue of democracy, safety, national security, election interference. Um, as well as the very important points Khadija was making about individuals being seen and having a share of voice um, in, their, in their communities and in their, in their countries. And so, um, you, know, I la you know, this obviously funding independent journalism that is accurate, that has broad access, is one of the ways to fight disinformation. Shining a light on autocratic practices, um, whether it's political corruption, um, you know, vote fixing, um, or, you know, um, even, you know, cronyism, 
is, is a way of reducing those practices, and it does put pressure on autocrats. Um, and we've got a lot of traction um, once large you know, politicians and governments have begun to understand that what we're doing here is essentially resisting autocracy and countering disinformation. Thanks. I mean, I, I, just before we come, come to you, I wanted to say one thing, Mackenzie Scott, if you're watching, I think her emails, her DMs are open. Um, and uh, just come to Ukraine. I mean, you know, I just, I wanted to ask you very briefly, each of you, to just have a little, you know, don't want to go too deeply into it, because obviously that's an enormous issue. I mean, there are a couple of things I wanted to bring up. One is I think that it has, from where I sit, it has, it seems to have crystallized something about where people stand in terms of quality information, disinformation. You know, we, um, the pandemic had people saying journalism is, is an essential service, even some governments. Um, but, you know, this, this has added something new, right? And the second thing, I think, going to your funding point of where the sources of funding for the fund came from, I was curious whether you're thinking about the public in light of, for example, how, ex you know, this extraordinary fundraising campaign that um, Jakub Parasinski and others have, um, have led for Ukraine's independent media. You know, I think... $10 million in total, um, you know, so in a sense that shows, what, you know, when, they're, when the public see a crisis and they understand and it's very clear to them the side they're on, they will put their hands into their pockets and support independent media. You know, so the, I, those two aspects were ones that I wanted to just ask you very quickly about and then I think we'll come for questions. So do start preparing and formulating your questions in a succinct, more succinct than mine. Hopefully. Okay, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the crisis in, in the Ukraine, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a, cat a catastrophe beyond, I mean, uh, our imagination. Um, but I think that the, re the, 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 the kinds of support um, to the media must consider um, Okay, let me rephrase that. I think what I want to say is that if we ensure that there is more funding going to media, to journalism, we can better sustain media so that they can be better buffered in times of crises. Um, that is the kind of approach I think I'd like to take. Yeah, I think that um, what I'm hoping is that the crisis in Ukraine, the war there, and you know, the absolute terrible nature of what's happening crystallizes the urgency of what we're dealing with. Um, the urgency of ensuring a media ecosystem is healthy, um, that is beyond the control of oligarchs or uh, nation states that are, seek to meddle in, in, in a country's politics. Because when, you know, when we're speaking to some funders um, on, at IFPIM, many would ask me, so you're not gonna be working in China? And obviously we're not gonna be able to work in China. We won't be legally allowed to work in China. But I think that what we have to think about actually is that from my perspective in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm sure Zoe can speak about this as well, is the huge investments China is making in media as a direct result of the declining resources available to newsrooms. So in South Africa, the independent news media group, which is one of the largest news media groups in South Africa, has a 30% Chinese government shareholding. In West Africa, if you pick up many newspapers, you'll find you know, the same article ca carrying different bylines across many newspapers, and that's because Chinese agencies are giving away their content for free, right? And you cannot blame the newsrooms for taking that, because when you have no ability to actually produce copy yourselves, that is the resource that's available to you. So I think that what I hope the crisis in Ukraine shows us is that to ensure that we are able to 
withstand the influence of malign actors, we need a strong information ecosystem. And just, I mean, it puts me in mind of there's a study by the Institute for Study of War, which is one of the sources that lots of people are using around Russia, Ukraine. And um, they did a, an analysis of, again, Russian media investments around the world. I think it's a couple of years old. You can find it on their site. I mean, I think Zoe and Khadija made very powerful points. I don't have much to add um, other than the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, FPIM has added Eastern Europe to its geographic scope. Um, we uh, are currently in startup mode and we're, we're hiring people, we're getting our infrastructure in place, but we hope to begin making grants before the end of the year. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the protocol for questions is as follows, because we are in COVID era, streaming era, Perugia. So um, I would like to take three questions in a bunch, and then I have to relay them so that the audio can be heard, if that's all right. So do please speak clearly and state who you are, if you can or want to, or it's safe to do so. Um, and I'll relay those questions. Um, I may summarize slightly, so if I say something terribly out of line when I take your question and relay it, please rugby tackle me to the ground and grab the mic. Um, okay, can we take three to start off with? Okay, I'm gonna pick from around the room. Right, uh, from you please, and then from you, and then from you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, Thank you. That was Heba Ali of, is that right? New Humanitarian, asking about among the shift of shift towards local media, is there also a role for more international level media and support within the fund or those kinds of mechanisms for it? Please. Okay, thank you. That's Joost from Zamana Media in Amsterdam, which is a Persian language uh, exile media, and asking about room for exile media in the fund. Um, I should actually say that last week, two weeks ago, in Europe, RSF Germany and the Schöpflin Stiftung and uh, Rudolf Augstein Stiftung launched a thing called the JX Fund, which is specifically around journalism in ex exile. So also have a look at that. Tweet it. Um, and then last question, over there. That's Brian Connolly, who actually worked for me many years ago. Hi, Brian. Um, and uh, asking about Afghanistan and the expenditure on Afghanistan, Iraq, um, you know, and, and perhaps you can take that. And where do you want to start? Uh, 
Um, perhaps I'll do Afghanistan, and then maybe Nishan can do Exal Media uh, and International. Yeah. Um, so thanks for the question about Afghanistan, and I think that um, you know when you know in setting up the fund, one of the key considerations we're trying to build into it is to ensure that we are there for the long term. That we are not, uh, you, you know, we're not going with the trends. We're not going where it's sexy. Um, I was speaking to colleagues from Mozambique a few um, a few weeks ago who told me that you know in the mid 90s, Mozambique was flooded with funding for media, and within like five to eight years, all of that funding disappeared, and the media ecosystem suffered, um, and is still suffering. So we want to ensure that that does not happen. Um, we want to make careful decisions, ensuring long-term funding um, to media where we, you know, where, we, uh, where we fund. And this is why we're starting off with this first open call, and I must say it's the first open call, very really slowly, because we are aware of this and we want to ensure that we build up um, and we're able to deliver on, this prom on these promises. Um, so you're absolutely right, and I think that we are especially aware of Afghanistan, um, and it is certainly among the countries you know, that we're mulling. Um, on the, um, the questions around international journalism and around Exile Media, uh, apologies for just omitting that because it's been a core part of our strategy since the beginning and is covered in our feasibility studies. So, you know, we are um, we're looking at country and regional media in, in the places Khadija mentioned, but we will also have a unit specifically looking at cross-border journalism and diaspora media and exile media. Um, and so um, the amount of money we can put towards that depends on the amount of money we can raise, um, but it's an in incredibly important part of the accountability journalism that, that we're considering. Other questions? There was a very rapid hand right there. Um, Thank you. One other question. Sorry. The, that, thank you. That is that is the question. That is a that final question is a beautiful one. So I am um, I'm going to summarise the two questions quickly, and then I'm going to do a very quick audience poll. Um, so a question from Slovenia, where 
the, the question in the journalism community appears to be about putting out the fire. Um, particularly, you know, how do you encourage and foster a sense of, you know, the value of journalism in coming demographics? You know, there are people in the room who I know work on issues like this. Um, and maybe you can approach them afterwards. Um, then the, uh, so younger, younger media consumers and so on who, whose behaviors and habits are extremely different, et cetera, et cetera. So how is the fun thinking about that? And then from our Nigerian colleague in the, in the back there asking, the, the first two questions I think were more logistical, but I think your, your last question, which is how do we make sure that this is a public interest fund, not a donor interest fund, is a very pertinent question for every funder in the entire conference. So uh, who wants to take those? I'll have a stab at that and uh, head over to Nishan. I can take sustainability one. Yeah, you go ahead. You don't want to be donor <laughs> <laughs> As a donor, I'm not the best place to answer that. I think Khadija's better place to answer that. Um, so this, there was a couple of questions about sustainability. And look, if I could tell you in the 60 seconds we have left how to make your organization sustainable, I would be the most popular man in Perugia, <laughs> which I'm definitively not. Um, but... Uh, your question was, how do we survive until we figure that out? That was the last part of your question. And that is really what this fund is about, is that it's going to take us time to figure that out. Um, many news organizations have not cracked the, uh, really how to access and engage young people. This is a problem across many of the countries in which we work. And so we hope to, first of all, fund some of that innovation, and secondly, learn from our grantees and share that innovation across the places in which we are working. While uh, the other types of innovation that I want to make sure we don't forget about, the regulatory innovation, the public subsidies, the other things that need to kick in, the tax innovation, while that's happening, to change the structure of the market. But what we can promise is we will find innovation that can, can help you try and solve that question and others in your situation too. Editorial independence is sacrosanct. Um, and that is why the structure of this fund is important because no single donor or group of donors will be able to influence who gets funded or why they get funded. And I think that that is really, really important because even the best intentioned newsrooms, when you are beholden to a single funder, you, your editorial independence may become eroded, especially if it's a matter of whether you're getting a check next month or not. So we want to take that away and we want to ensure that editorial independence is sacrosanct. That is, it's, it's no, there, there is no question about it. It must be built into everything that we're doing. We will never ask our grantees to write about us. We will never ask our grantees to write about people who fund us. You, I will ask them to write nice things about me, I think. Uh, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> But again, editorial independence is sacrosanct, and we would be doing more damage to the course of journalism and the future of journalism if this becomes something that serves the interests of donors rather than the public. So I think that is essential. Um, I hope that covers that. In terms of how do we assert the value of journalism, I don't think it's one thing, but I think that it's, it's a movement that we have to build. It's a movement, it's not one thing and it's not one person, it's not only journalists. But I think it is about trying to reach beyond ourselves be to society. Um, and it is about climbing out of our newsrooms and trying to understand how people perceive us and trying to build the bridges and try to be transparent about the role of journalists through history and understand how we must evolve too. Because you know, as Nishant says, we want to emerge with a new paradigm of journalism, and that is essential. Okay, so we're gonna, 30 seconds? Not even 30 seconds. <laughs> Not for independent information. Um, okay, well, thank you very, very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to the panel, and enjoy the rest of the festival.